So as our conjugated system gets larger and larger, it's possible that we'll continue to add 30 or 40 nanometers until we get to a point where we're actually in the visible spectrum. And so then we can do visible light spectroscopy, which is spectroscopy involving light that is in the visible range of 390 to 700 nanometers. And a good example of this is beta carotene, which is the compound in carrots that gives them their orange color. And the way that it works is similar to how ultraviolet spectroscopy works. You have a very large conjugated system, and so fairly low energy light is now capable of finding an electron that it can excite into its lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Beta carotene has 11 conjugated pi bonds in its system. And so that gets you into the visible light range somewhere in the high 400s to low 500 nanometer range. The things to be aware of with visible spectroscopy is, yes, you can plot them on a spectroscopy graph much like these other types, but also because it's in the visible range, you can also see it. And so something to recognize is that the color that you see, the observed light, is the light that's being reflected. And that means it's not the light that's being absorbed. And so you have to understand a little bit about complementary colors, for example, red and green are complementary colors, and blue and orange are complementary colors. And essentially what happens is it will absorb one wavelength of light and it will reflect the other wavelengths. And so the way it will appear is that you will see the wavelengths that are not being absorbed. So beta carotene happens to be in a range where it absorbs sort of a blue-green light. And as a result, you don't see the blue-green, you see the opposite of that, which is sort of in the orange-red range. And so be aware that the color that you see with visible light spectroscopy is the complementary color to the wavelength that's actually being absorbed. You can also plot this on a graph, and then it's fairly straightforward. You just see a certain nanometer wavelength, and it becomes clear that there's a curve where the maximum absorption is somewhere. And once again, that can give you clues as to what sort of light is being absorbed. And then we can move on to infrared spectroscopy, which is as far as using pure light, this is the lowest energy that you'll encounter with most organic chemistry. The way IR spectroscopy works is that there isn't enough energy carried by infrared light in order to actually bump an electron from one place to the next. However, what it can do is it can cause a polar bond to oscillate at what they call a resonant frequency. And so remember that a bond isn't just a line like you often draw it in chemistry. A bond is electrons interacting and they're being attracted to the positively charged nuclei, but they're being repelled from each other. And so most bonds, and particularly polar bonds, will have a frequency that they like to oscillate. And infrared light will come in and it will cause that bond to oscillate in such a way that it's at its resonant frequency. And whatever resonant frequency is tells us a lot about the bond that we're interacting with. And so unlike other ones where you tend to see a spike, with infrared it's actually the opposite. With infrared, instead you see dips whenever the light is being absorbed. So this is kind of absorption. And this here is going to be uh, emission. You can say the amount of light that makes it through. And whenever there's a dip, that means that the light is being absorbed. And there are a few values to be aware of when you're doing infrared spectroscopy that are worth committing to memory for an OCHEM class or for the MCAT. And those are if you see a broad dip, so it's a sort of broad shape like that, at the 3200 to 3500 range, that tells you that you have an OH group, an alcohol functional group there. And this is measured in cycles per centimeter, which is, C, you could also see that as CM to the negative one. And that is going to be, if, you're, if you see a broad dip between 3200 and 3500, that's when you're dealing with an OH alcohol functional group. If you see a sharp dip, in the same range, then you're dealing with an amino group, something containing nitrogen and maybe some other R groups or nitrogen bound to a couple of hydrogens.
If you see a sharp and jagged dip in the 1800 to 2000 range, that tells you that you have a saturated hydrocarbon. Usually not that useful in infrared spectroscopy because so many compounds have a saturated hydrocarbon. But it is worth noting that if you see sharp and jagged in the 1800 to 2000 range, you're dealing with a saturated hydrocarbon. And then the other very high yield one to be aware of is at 1700, if you see a sharp dip, that's your carbonyl group, which is a carbon double bound to oxygen. So your C double bound to O, that will be a sharp dip or a sharp spike at 1700 cycles per centimeter. And so the big ones to be aware of are the OH group, which is broad at 3200 to 3500, the amino group, which is sharp at 3200 to 3500, and the carbonyl group, C double bound to O, which is sharp at 1700. And so these are all within a functional group region, which ranges from about 1400 to 4000. And it corresponds with the energy level of infrared light that causes those polar bonds, those OH bonds, those C double O bonds, it causes them to vibrate at their resonant frequency. So something in this 1400 to 4000 range, if you see a dip or perhaps a more broad dip, that will tell you a lot about what functional groups are present. The other thing for the MCAT to be very aware of is you have a region called the fingerprint region, and that is between 600 and 1400 cycles per centimeter. The fingerprint region is called fingerprint because it is unique to the exact molecule. Notice that these are only for a functional group, but you can have large alcohols and smaller alcohols. Whereas when you're in the fingerprint region, there will be a very, very distinctive pattern that tells you exactly which molecule you're working with because the fingerprint region complex vibrations are curves that are so distinctive that you can know exactly what molecule you're dealing with. These will be found in the 600 to 1400 cycles per centimeter range. And it's a very complex thing because there are so many molecules that you're unlikely to have to analyze this for example, on an organic chemistry exam or on your MCAT. However, you should know that the fingerprint region exists. And the fingerprint region is called this because it is so distinctive for that compound that if you see what's going on in the fingerprint region, you can often know exactly what molecule is present in your sample because it's absorbing such a distinctive pattern of light in the infrared region. And so these are the major types of spectroscopy that you'll be dealing with. And if you see them organized this way in terms of increasing energy, then it becomes clear what is being accomplished at each level by each different type of light. With gamma rays and something that is so high energy, those essentially are capable of obliterating a compound. They can take single bonds and break them. And as a result, you don't tend to use this for spectroscopy, but you should be aware that very, very high energy radiation can destroy compounds. Then you can get to the ultraviolet range, which is very high energy. It's a very high energy type of light. And what that does is with a small conjugated system, so something as simple as a double bonded ethylene or a double bond, single bond, double bond butadiene, it has enough energy that it can take one of those electrons and bump it from the highest occupied orbital into the lowest unoccupied orbital by creating a little bridge between these two adjacent p orbitals that don't yet have a pi bond, but because they're p orbitals and they're on adjacent atoms, they could potentially become a pi bond. So ultraviolet light is high enough energy that it can excite something in a very small conjugated system. As the system gets bigger, you keep adding 30 or 40 nanometers for every additional conjugated pi bond and maybe five for every R group that intersects that. Once you get your system big enough, for example, with something like beta carotene, now you're getting to the point where light in the visible spectrum, which is lower energy than ultraviolet, now the light in the visible spectrum is capable of bumping one of those electrons from a pi bond to its lowest unoccupied one in the adjacent position. And then you see that in the visible range, you can see a spectroscopy graph, or with your eyes, you can observe colors because the color that is being absorbed is opposite to the color that's actually hitting your eyes.
And then when we get to the infrared range, this is now at a point where it doesn't have enough energy to actually bump an electron from one place to another. But what it can do is it can take a polar bond and it can cause the electrons in that bond to oscillate, to kind of dance in such a way that they're at a special resonant frequency. And when it does that, the dips in your IR spectroscopy graph will tell you about what functional groups are present. For example, your OH group is a broad dip at 3200 to 3500. Your CO group, which is the other really important one to be aware of, is a sharp dip at 1700. Those will tell you exactly what functional groups you have present in your compound. Or if you're looking at this fingerprint region in the 600 to 1400 cycles per centimeter range, then it tells you what's going on. It's essentially a vibration that causes the entire molecule to vibrate in such a distinctive way that it can be considered the molecular fingerprint. And the fingerprint region can tell you exactly what compound you're dealing with. Whereas in this region, it tells you what functional groups are present, but it might be a large alcohol or it could be something like ethanol, which is a very small one. And so you go from something that can pretty much excite any electron and obliterate any bond to something that excites conjugated electrons in very small conjugated systems. Then you get visible and it's a larger conjugated system that it can excite. And then you get to infrared, which doesn't bump electrons from one position to another, but it does cause them to vibrate in very distinctive ways. And this is how all spectroscopy works. You shoot the light to your receiver, you shoot it through the sample, and then by comparing the two, you get information about what that light is being absorbed to do. And when it's absorbed, it tells you what molecular action is going on. And hopefully this helped lay out a lot of what's going on when you're analyzing different types of spectroscopy.